58. We'll hear from Ryan Burns here momentarily. Go for Illustrated covers the University of Minnesota. They open up a couple of home games, actually three consecutive home games, non-conference New Mexico State, Western Illinois, and then Colorado, whose name, of course, has been involved ever since the Pac-12 lost USC, UCLA. What is their future? And, uh, and so we'll have that in, in just a second. In fact, Ryan Burns from uh, Gopher Illustrated. Manny Navarro at the top of the hour, who covers the University of Miami, will join us. Ryan joins us on Sikkim 365 Radio and 365 Sports. Ryan, I was just talking about the opening uh, non-conference games, all of them at home, uh, but Colorado, that third game. So where is P.J. Fleck as we start the next year with him? Is, is it sustaining? Are they better? What, what's happening with them? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, it was just a practice last night, and my assessment of this team would be for PJ's team in year six, they have about as much depth as they had, have had in any of the years, which is what you kind of want to be in year six of a program. You mentioned the non-conference. I think while the name recognition of some of those teams may not exactly be the world beaters, at least there's a little bit of storylines for Minnesota fans where Jerry Kill, the former Minnesota Golden Gopher football coach, comes back into town on September 1st, as he's the new coach of the New Mexico State Aggies. And the last time we heard from Jerry Kill, it was in 2017 when he said, and I quote, I'll never step foot back inside that stadium again. <laughs> so five years later, little does he know he's going to be uh, coaching that New Mexico State team. And you mentioned Colorado. Minnesota just fired their offensive coordinator last season by the name of Mike Sanford. Well, Mike Sanford comes back into town as the offensive coordinator as the University of Colorado Buffalo. So there's at least a few different storylines in the non-conference. It's, an, it's a non-conference that Minnesota should go 3-0 and in, but as we saw last year, uh, you know, the Bowling Green game, one of the worst losses in program history, can sneak up on you. But when I look at this team from what I've seen with my own two eyes here in the last few weeks, I think there's quite a bit of depth on this team, especially defensively, which is where this uh, Big Ten West is going to be won and lost. Does, it, does the season kind of swing – on the Michigan State game then? I think it's the most important game of the season for that very reason, because in theory, both teams should be 3-0. and Michigan State and East Lansing specifically is a place that Minnesota has had trouble in in the last decade or two. And I think we're going to find out a lot about both teams. We're going to find out if Mel Tucker's team and you know, year one of a program last year was kind of an aberration more or less. Or were they a legitimate team that is going to be competing each and every year in the Big Ten East with the Ohio States and the Michigans of the world? But it's also a great barometer game for Minnesota because if they're going to finally get over the hump and win the West, that's going to be one of the games that we're going to look back on at the end of the season that could potentially be the key for it. So I think it is a gigantic game, and even the game next week, the following one, when Minnesota's a Big Ten home opener against Purdue. I mean, Purdue is a team that I think a lot of people – are potentially high on. They have a very easy schedule, especially with the crossover games in the Big Ten. But those two games are going to be very pivotal if Minnesota is going to be actually a contender here this fall. Yeah, and, and there's no doubt. You, you have the dogs, it seems like, with Penn State, of course, has been up and down. But Ohio State, Michigan last year, Michigan State. And, and Minnesota played Ohio State pretty well in the opening week. You mentioned Bowling Green, but the West seems to be very much open. Wisconsin and Iowa have been the ones who have been more consistent. All the others seem to be kind of, you know, Minnesota was 9-4 and four last year. Is, is that what gives everybody in that division hope? I think so. I think nine wins to me will win the West this year. And now whether that's going to be Wisconsin, whether that's going to be Iowa, Minnesota, potentially Purdue in there, it's going to be who's actually going to win these crossover games, number one, because you look at the crossover games for each of those three teams. I was got Ohio State and Michigan on the schedule, which is going to be uh, quite the, quite the crossover games for them. Wisconsin has to travel to Columbus. Minnesota misses both Michigan and Ohio State, but to your point, they have to travel on the road to a whiteout game uh, at Penn State. They have to travel on the road to Michigan State, Nebraska. No matter if they're one and seven or seven and one heading into that game, they're going to have ninety thousand people in that stadium in early November. So it's going to come down to. Can Minnesota get off the hump against a team like Kirk Ferentz in Iowa where they're 0-5 against them? And can they continue to find success against Wisconsin where they've found two of their last four? So I agree with you. I think the West is incredibly wide open. 
I also think it comes down to which quarterback of those three teams do you trust? Do you trust Graham Mertz from Wisconsin? Do you trust Spencer Petras from Iowa? Do you trust Tanner Morgan from Minnesota? There's a lot of questions, and I think a lot of them are going to be answered offensively for which team is going to play in Indianapolis. Ryan, how do Minnesota fans feel about the additions of USC and UCLA? I think they're pretty excited about it. I can tell you I'd much rather be traveling to Los Angeles in November than I would to Champaign, <laughs> Illinois, or Ryan Field. And I, Trust me, I've been to enough Ryan Field games where it's Northwestern, it's late October, there's a 25-mile-an-hour wind coming off the lake, there's 5,000 people in the stands. I've done that enough. Now, I would love to see if and when it happens, UCLA or USC travel to the Midwest in November because – Again, maybe it's something that just us in the media think about too much, but those Southern California boys coming up to play in the cornfields of Iowa or even further north in Madison or Minneapolis when it's 40 degrees or 30 degrees or even snow, I would love to see how those teams react to just the weather conditions. So I think there's a lot of excitement here in the Twin Cities, if nothing else, just to have an excuse to potentially get out of the cold and head to the sunshine of LA. Yeah, that's a that's a great point. By the way, I, you mentioned I had to giggle as a lifelong Huskers fan. They could be seven and one or one and seven. That's so damn true about them now. It just drives me crazy. How about this? Is all all of this realignment, all of the regrouping, or realignment, or the additions, or whatever else is going on in college football is all about the money. And there's only two sports that make it, and that's football and obviously men's basketball. Has, has there been any at least discussion among the other sports about yet two more teams and yet they're in the West Coast? Does that even ring? Does that even on the radar? It's not going to change it, but is it on the radar at all? Uh, could you phrase that question again? Yeah, you have two sports that make money, football and men's yeah. basketball. That's what everything's being driven by, the TV, the realignment, whatever else. My question is, do you have any – has there been any blowback at all from the other sports, the non-revenue sports, about adding two schools from the West Coast? No, I don't think so, because I think everybody knows that the reality is once you add in UCLA and USC, and again, we're going to find out how much money that Kevin Warren's bringing into this conference here, but say Minnesota was making $45, $50 million from the previous media rights deal. Well, if they're going to be making now close to 80 to $100 million, that's more money that the athletic department has to potentially just support the non-revenue sports, the cross countries and the what else, whatever else sports of the world. And so, yes, are there going to be some travel issues w associated with that? Absolutely. But if the alternative is, well, if we don't add them, we might have to cut your sport. Well, I think those yeah. athletes can understand. Yeah, no, no question. Is there any concern that as these conferences get bigger and you have more of these dogs or blue bloods, no matter how good Minnesota was last year at nine and four and some of the other schools, is there ever any concern that the conferences are going to go to this Super 2, whatever it is, and I don't think they will, but if they do, that other schools will be left farther behind rather than being where they are now? Absolutely. I mean, I can't imagine being in the Big 12 right now and just looking around and seeing what's happening. Uh, especially, again, it's all driven by money. You, you already mentioned it. It all comes down to these media rights deals. And I will be very curious to see where college sports or even just conferences are at in five years because, again, if the Big Ten is going to be making somewhere between 90 and $100 million annually from these media rights deals, while the Big 12 is somewhere around 30 to $40 million, that is a gigantic, in theory, uh, advantage for those Big Ten schools or those SEC schools over the ACC and the Big 12 and the Pac-12. So I am going to be incredibly curious to kind of see how the world of college sports continues to – evolve you know i don't know if it's going to be super two but i also think that i don't have the foresight to really understand that this thing is evolving at a very rapid pace and i think we all are just along for the ride and minnesota's part of that i mean again they've earned what flex done and they have great stuff in other sports as well uh that they, they uh they're they're perfect right they're in the conference that's going to make 80 75 or 90 whatever million it's going to be a year so they're they're as happy as they could be I would be. I mean, I, I saw something around the interwebs here in the last couple of weeks that yep. Minnesota was potentially talking in the Big 12, and I asked a couple of people in there. They gave me that exact response um, was, why in the world would we get away from all this money that's going to be coming in? Absolutely not. They're positioned well. Now, does that mean that they're going to be competing 
at a high level, like a high, high level against the Ohio States and the Michigans and see if USC can get back to where they were some years ago. But I don't know. But I just know that at least you'll have the resources in theory to have it on hand to at least try and compete, whereas maybe some of the schools in the Big 12 won't even just have those resources. But Ryan, money is a burden. You yeah, don't need yeah, all of yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. Mean, and, and I'm glad you brought that up. I was trying to ask the question without asking the question that you brought up about some of the smoke because I didn't think that was valid in any way, shape, or form. But I'm well, glad that I asked you about, it, you know, just the future and where Minnesota is. And, Ryan, I'm sure you'll see this. Every time Realign comes around, somebody will oh, yeah. say, oh, yeah. like, oh, this team will leave the SEC because they yeah. can be better in this conference. And, like, look, uh, or, you can be bad and rich yeah. or, you know, good and, and you know, okay, I guess, but money-wise. What's the health of Muhammad Ibrahim? He is 100% ready to go. I've been watching him at practice. He's taking – Taking hits, he looks like the same old Mo. Now, I'm also well aware that Achilles injuries for skill position players, more specifically running backs, has been a death sentence, more or less, for a lot of those guys. But I think the beauty of Mo Ibrahim is he isn't exactly a burner, and he never has been. So if he's running a 4-7-8 instead of a 4-7-3 now because of this Achilles injury, that's not really going to hamper his game. Yeah. And, you know, you mentioned him. I think – I don't know for whatever the reason is outside of the Achilles injury, people forget that just we're talking 22 months ago, he was the big 10 running back of the year and he was sensational. Yep. You know, he's got over 500 collegiate carries and he's averaging something around 5.5 yards per carry. I don't know if that'll translate to the NFL at all because of, you know, the athleticism that's needed at that position on Sundays. But I just know this. He's a darn good running back, and he looks like he is very healthy to me right now. He's a bell cow. I'm glad he's healthy. I hope everything goes well for him. And, Ryan, thanks for the knowledge. Appreciate your time. Yep, thanks. It's Ryan Burns, Gophers Illustrated, with us on Minnesota. Sikkim 365 Radio. Coming up next, we check in with you, Miami, and our friend Manny Navarro. And what's happening there? They've had a pretty nice little run the last few months. How does it translate?